Welcome, everyone. Sorry for that glitch. I am Nathan Howe, Department Head of Interior Architecture and Industrial Design, here to introduce Louis Schump, our next lecturer in our Distinguished Ekdahl Lecture Series. This lecture is partially funded by the Kansas State Student Governance Association Fine Arts Fee, and a special thanks to the sustained support of the Ekdahl family. Louis Schump is an award-winning designer who received his Bachelor of Architecture from the neighboring school, Washington University in St. Louis. He then went on to develop a passion for designing interiors, enhancing space through furniture and user experience. After leaving the Midwest, he, he has worked for a who's who of international architectural firms from MBBJ to HOK to Rap Studio and more. Lewis is a giving person who cares deeply on how the user experiences design. One example of how giving Lewis is, is that he participates in a mentor program at, at, for at-risk youth in the Bay Area, giving his guidance for the next generation of potential designers. Another example is normally we might ask a guest lecturer to participate in reviews and special presentations throughout the day of their lecture. But however, Lewis has been extra generous in allowing us to seek his knowledge on multiple days this week. In this time when virtual is the space we all reside in, it is with tremendous appreciation that I thank you, Lewis, for giving your time above and beyond that is typical for our students and faculty. I can only imagine the enriching environment that you have created in the Ginsler office in Saint San Francisco, where Lewis is the creative director. I have also found a kinship with Lewis as we both have country homes that we use to slow down, reconnect and reinvigorate ourselves. I hope that gem of a home you have designed for your family north of San Francisco has found its way into this presentation. If not, then maybe on our, your next trip to Manhattan in person this time, we can get that treat. If you have spoken with Lewis for very long, his passion for design and education surfaces almost immediately. He is a caring soul and and he strives for in his design work is to create and to get to the heart of the problem to find the design opportunity. Here to present design equals the solution to an agreed upon problem, true or false, is Lewis Shump. And he has told me that part of the uh, rules of engagement is that if you put in the chat, you'll find in YouTube, um, that he will uh, respond immediately. So I'm supposed to interrupt him. So I, I like that privilege. Um, right, Nathan, gets to, Nathan gets to ask me the question. Yeah, I'll ask the question, but you can put it in the chat. So please do. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Lewis. Great, Nathan, thank you so much for having me. Um, I wish I was there in person. Uh, I'm gonna share my, before I get going, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started in earnest. Can everyone, let's see, there we go. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so Nathan mentioned I've been, I've been busy this week. Um, I sat in on Kanoa's Studio 2 uh, sketchbook project, Mariana's uh, Studio 6 mid-crit, uh, Viva's graduate thesis, and Michelle O'Neill's uh, third year studio. So many of you have seen me already. Um, so th thanks again for having me. Um, I have to say that when I've been telling people uh, at the office about this, they've all been envious. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Oops. Get the technical thing going here. There we go. So um, I was scheduled, as Nathan mentioned, to give this lecture um, a year ago. Um, between then and now, I returned to Gensler after a 20 year break. Uh, and I think like most of you, um, I've been working from home, though some of you were in the studio today, and again, I was super envious. Um, but also like you, I think I've learned uh, quite a few things about myself. You know, one is that I needed a dedicated desk and a bigger monitor, something that my family would not allow to occur in the living room. So I took up residence in uh, 
the guest room and now have my big monitor and my dedicated desk. But one of the things I learned about myself is that I can pretend for a couple of hours at a time that this camera that I'm looking at doesn't really exist. And that you know, if I were able to see all of you, uh, what I would see is the room behind you and not the wall that's sitting behind my monitor. Um, the, what made me realize this is recently I saw a coworker's workspace and was shocked at how small the room was because behind me wasn't my room or my office, but the wall that his monitor was against. Um, and it made me learn, you know, made me realize something else about myself, which is that I had used space as a way of remembering things. You know, I did certain things on the train. I thought about certain things in the office. I did a different type of work at home, but it was all very place-based. Um, and once we started working at home, I became, you know, a little disoriented. Um, I hoped that it was an age um, and that it was really attributed to being in one space most of the time. Um, but one thing that I, I discovered that hadn't changed over the last year was what I wanted to talk to you about today, which is, you know, design and what it, not what it is, not, you know, what is it made out of, but why is it made out of that thing? You know, what is the reason behind the designs uh, that we're talking about? So uh, as Nathan mentioned, I'm a creative director at Gensler. And part of my job is to know as much about the current and possible upcoming needs of my client as possible and to organize the studio's efforts accordingly. So I work with a strategy and design director to ensure that the teams uh, that I work with are meeting their personal growth because it's important for everyone on the team to have their own personal objectives being met while also exceeding the expectations of the client. Um, a couple of years ago, my team was hired to work on the schoolhouse. Um, and the schoolhouse is a very sort of quaint name for an executive training uh, space uh, for Google on their Mountain View campus here in California. And we were asked to create a learning environment that was hyper-physical. Um, some of you today have heard me talk about engaging all the senses. This space explicitly uh, wanted to engage all the senses, including smell. Um, and the reason that the curriculum developers at Google wanted a space that did this is that it would assist engaging the whole person, assist in breaking down the barriers between leaders, because the goal is that leaders work as a team, but also between leaders and their teams. And, you know, essentially it's a space designed to make connections on many different levels. So this is one of the entries. Um, to that space. And, you know, we had to get creative with some of our installations. So these are jump ropes hanging from the ceiling that when the fan turns on, create this visual texture, but also create this sound that begins to disconnect you from the uh, space outside from your workday and connect you or get you ready to connect with your coworkers inside of the space. So uh, this is that environment designed to change over time um, or change in the middle of the day. Um, it has been hugely popular, hugely successful. Um, and it also, and this is, don't tell your faculty members that I'm telling you this, but it's successful because it breaks every single rule that Google has. It does not meet their acoustic guidelines, their technology guidelines, their audio, visual, or conference guidelines. And, uh, but it does solve the problem that we were asked to solve. And it is working for the leaders that are being educated there. Um, and it's not a manifestation of design standards or design guidelines. Um, so uh, something to remember. As an aside, and this is uh, what it means to be a creative director, at least in my mind, as opposed to being a design director, is that we can you know, we can bring our creativity to any number of problems. And, you know, during the design process of the schoolhouse, we learned that the, uh, the organization that the faculty of the schoolhouse belonged to really wasn't embodying the behaviors that they were seeking to teach the executives. So that team of folks at Google hired us to uh, consult on the reorganization of their group so they could better connect to their mission and better be better teachers to the um, 
the executives that they uh, are in charge of helping. So another, another lesson there. This is where I want someone to ask a question, but no one's asking one yet. So um, I'll keep going. Um, so I'm still thinking about education, partially because I'm here and talking to college students, uh, partially because uh, my husband and I have a 17 year old son who's graduating high school this year. Um, the challenge in his case isn't to design a space for all the senses or to make connections, but to find a small liberal arts school that's strong in the sciences and that has a Mandarin department. And uh, what his other dad and I uh, want for ourselves is that it's connected to San Francisco by uh, one flight. Um, so that's our parameter, not his. And as part of this exploration, we uh, went to Wash U, as uh, Nathan mentioned, my alma mater, in the fall of 2019 before the rest of the world shut down. And I was reminded of something that I heard on my first day of architecture school. Um, my professor, as part of our orientation, said, um, and this is literally the first day of school, um, if you're going to design space, you need to know how to move through it, take dance. It wasn't a suggestion, it was sort of a command. Um, and I was impressionable at the time. So I signed, I had some extra time in my schedule. So I signed up for uh, ballet and I ended up taking two years of ballet and two years of modern dance and um, have thought about the design of space or the people moving through space as choreography ever since then. Um, and I, I don't know if every day, but most days that plays out in, in the work that I do. Um, my husband owns art galleries. Um, used to be one in New York and one here in San Francisco. Now it's only here in San Francisco. Um, but they're good examples of what I mean by choreography. Um, he needs maximum space, uh, maximum wall space. And, you know, he needs for people to be able to flow along with the exhibition without having sort of interruptions and for the space to feel rich without being too expensive. Um, the walls, you know, usually are free from the columns so the space can flow around them. Um, you never have to leave a room the same way you entered. So again, a little bit more about that flow. And the existing space contributes to the texture uh, and materiality in contrast to the white walls that the art is hanging on. So that's what the San Francisco Gallery looks like. Um, and, you know, when I look at this, uh, we have had a couple of dance parties here. Um, but the space moves and it feels like choreography to me. And then that's what New York looked like. Um, very similar design principles, a very different execution uh, in a different building. So oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember when, probably three or four years ago, uh, Dropbox posed a very different challenge um, to the team. And it was to design a sensuous, space for people at work. Um, it's like, what does that mean? Uh, so through a, a series of questions and workshops, you know, they communicated to us that they wanted to use as few office conventions as possible. No ceiling tile, no, um, oh, no fluorescent lights, uh, as little carpet as possible. Um, they wanted everything that you touch to be a real material, something that was crafted. They wanted no plastic laminate, no conventional door handles. Um, and where you, we couldn't afford to give them something that was crafted, they really encouraged us to use color. So Lewis, you asked for it. I got a, the oh, first good. question good. Uh, from Ashlyn. How much of a challenge is expense in design? How do you commonly solve a problem like that? How, how much of a challenge is expensive or inexpensive? Expense. Like, is it hard to spend a lot of money? <laughs> I think, or the uh, inverse of that, maybe. I don't know, <laughs> your clients, maybe uh, it, it is both a, a, a fact of having too many means. It's, it's well, I've had, I've had the luxury of both, right? And I say luxury because having, having a lot of money to spend means that you can execute on your ideas in a way that you may never have had to before. Um, it makes you collaborate with other people and craftsmen and um, again, people that you might not have had a chance to work with before. 
Um, on the other hand, super tight budgets, and you'll see some examples later, are incredibly challenging because it forces you to set aside all of your conventions. Um, if you know to do this thing, it takes A, B, and C, but you only have enough money for A, but you want something that's more than just A, you have to set all those preconceptions aside and approach the project differently. And I think that that's um, equally luxurious and uh, maybe even more creative. Um, you guys can tell me at the end, I'll, I'll point out the projects that are super budget conscious. Um, this is actually one of them. The galleries are probably the most budget conscious um, because it's, you know, it's, it's our money. Um, but Dropbox was very conscious about budget. We just chose to spend it in very particular ways. So rooms like this, like the library, are just sheetrock, carpet, and an incredibly beautiful custom walnut library table. But everything else is actually pretty inexpensive. Um, this is in a multi-purpose room. Um, again, trying to make things not conventional. The marker boards appear to be sort of framed objects that lean against the wall. Uh, the doors in the back have non-standard uh, door poles. And um, because we couldn't afford to have custom furniture or um, custom furniture, we sort of made different meeting rooms or multi-purpose rooms uh, feel different through the use of color alone. And then this is the entry to their cafe. And we wanted to afford all custom tiles, but we couldn't. So we paid for 13 hand-painted drawings and then had the tile maker digitally transfer them to the tiles. So it's a custom design, hand-painted, but digitally reproduced for the project. So creative, collaborative, and affordable. So um, at Gensler in San Francisco, I'm part of the Flex Studio. And in Gensler language, Flex means that we're combining different disciplines. So in our case, our Flex Studio combines strategy, brand, and digital experience design. So you know, the reason I bring this up is that if you refrain from labeling the studio architecture, interiors, or landscape, then you avoid the presupposition um, of what the nature of the answer to that given, to that agreed upon problem might be. And you're free to um, take the problem on its own merits and solve, uh, solve it in the best way as opposed to the way people or yourself are expecting to solve it. Um, a large part of my job is helping clients discover, understand, and agree upon that problem. Um, I'm currently working on a project in Tokyo that is a real estate portfolio strategy project. And the question there is, you know, when are they going to run out of space and where should they lease more space when that happens? I don't know if you guys have run across Tableau yet, but it's a, a visualization tool that um, visualizes data that we've been using to create dashboards to generate scenarios that leadership can then, um, well, we're using a method called choosing by advantages to help leadership decide on which scenario they should agree upon uh, moving forward for their real estate. And what we do is you know, build out <clears throat> process maps that show a client you know, what the direction that we're going and how we're going to get there, even if we don't know exactly where we're going to end up. So in this particular case, we're you know, collecting all the information about the sites. We're benchmarking against you know, the company's program targets. We're having conversations with all the uh, key stakeholders. And then after those conversations, we're looking to understand the campus strategy, understand PA stands for product areas, um, work styles and needs. And from benchmarking, you know, what shortages or overages do we have? Um, and what is the demand versus the supply over time? And we visualize all that through dashboards so that we can generate a program for an expanded space, um, test fit to validate that that program will work in the space that we've identified, and um, make sure that uh, TNT is Turner and Townsend, um, their cost estimators. So make sure that they understand the cost implications of the scenarios that we've generated. So we try to gamify it. Um, because it makes it more fun for people. So in this case, you can either set the game by identifying the variation on the variables that are in the green boxes 
then you can watch the game and we can look at the visualizations of data either in the time-based view or a floor-based view. So of these different product areas, who sits on uh, which floor or how are we looking from a supply and demand capacity over time? And then we created a move simulator, which we call playing the game, which allows folks to see if they can move different groups of people around, if they can make more space and make that space last longer. And then we bring everything together and show them in this process map that we look at the, you know, the different, the time-based view, the targets that are set by the organization, the existing program gaps, um, and then we use that shortage or overage to generate a program for the new building. Um, and this gets everyone on board to um, what they're gonna be encountering over the next, this process like this usually takes about six weeks, six weeks to 12 weeks, um, but it sets them up for success in the future. And sometimes we get the design projects that result from an exercise like this, and sometimes we don't. <clears throat> so one of the things that Michelle Wempe and I have in common is one, a couple of clients, uh, but we used to both do a lot of law firms. Um, and back, back in the day, I used to say that if I had you know, the written answers to 10 questions, I could have 90% or 95% of the information I needed to design a law firm. And that the last 5%, you know, that idiosyncratic part, uh, the part that you had to spend more time getting to, that you had to ask more questions to understand, uh, is much more interesting, much harder to get at, as I mentioned. Um, and I would describe my job currently as really being almost entirely devoted to that 5%. So I wanted to show a little bit of what I mean by that. So um, this is the floor plan of a law firm that I started uh, working with when they first formed 27 years ago. Um, a group of five partners had been isolated in the law firm that they were working with in some far corner of a very large office space. And they decided they really didn't need the rest of that organization. So they split off, started their own firm, and they wanted to make sure that that kind of isolation didn't happen in their new office. So from the very beginning, they used architecture as a tool to build their culture. Um, they wanted to have camaraderie. They wanted to have transparency so that if I, as a young attorney, was walking by a partner's office, I would see that he or she were there and I could go in and ask a question. And they wanted an approach that would allow them to have a subset of attorneys move every six months to prevent clicks from forming again, to prevent uh, folks from doing to them what they did to the firm they came from. And we've elaborated on these, these ideas over the last 27 years, but this is an example of what some of their spaces look like. Uh, this is a photograph of black glass reflecting the entrance into their space. Uh, this is a view from an open uh, sort of lounge co-working space that you can see through the open space, uh, open ceiling to the glass offices at the perimeter. Um, one of the things that happened um, over time is that they wanted the interior of the space to feel dynamic and be related to the exterior. So we removed most color from the interior so that when, when the color of the daylight changed, if a cloud passed between the building and the sun, the entire sense of the interior would change along with it. Uh, because they spent a lot of time selecting offices to be in locations they found beautiful, either near nature or compelling from an architectural point of view downtown. And this view is through two conference rooms, uh, uh, actually three conference rooms in a private office. Um, about 45% of the interior walls are glass. So room 98. Yeah, um, Lewis. Oh yeah, good. Couple more question. questions. So from JC, uh, you said earlier that much inspiration of, for your spaces is derived from seemingly non-related things like dance and ballet. Mm -hmm. How much of those styles of ideation and design comes forward when working? That's that's a really good question. I think it's I think sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's super conscious. Um, the project I'm going to touch on next, Room 98, is a very conscious choreography project. Um, 
and revolves around how people move and gather. Um, so it's very, very directly tied to those issues. Something like Gunderson, um, because they had such a strong idea about what they needed the space to do, there is, it goes back to a little bit more of what the galleries are about, which is, is it has to do with the ability for space to flow, but also for your vision to be able to flow, um, and less about um, actual choreography of people or, um, let's say less about choreography of people. And actually related to that is a question from Chloe when you're talking about the senses. Uh, she mm -hmm. asks, when creating an experience for users focused on sensory elements, what helps you dictate the decisions being made and how do you maintain a balance and not over overstimulating or understimulating, she says. A super good question. Um, I think it, it depends on it depends on the organization. I think it depends on to the kinds of activities. The, let's let's put it more directly. It depends on the amount of control um, the leadership of an organization want to try to exert on the people working there. So. In the schoolhouse, we deliberately had to make a very strong effort to disconnect leadership from thinking about the work that they were leaving behind outside of this space and connect them to this space. So sound, smell, movement, color, were all deliberately different from a typical work environment to help reset their mind um, to a new task. Um, someplace like Gunderson, less so, in room 98, very similar to the schoolhouse, um, there was a, it's a sort of sales, it's a customer experience center. So it's someplace that uh, people are brought to um, be told how, in this case, how spending more money on their ads uh, can increase exposure in their marketplace that they're trying to target. So we wanted people to concentrate on the environment. We wanted people to sort of be uh, seduced into being in the moment. So we had a custom scent made. Uh, all the rooms change color depending on the time of day um, and we can control it manually. Um, and the rooms change uh, so that every time you come back because we wanted people to come back, um, we wanted it to be a different experience every time they came back. So we needed to control those uh, experiences. They're all very subtle. I doubt if anyone other than the color, I doubt if anyone would understand that that was being done to them. Well, the, the last question is, is kind of related to this. You were talking about color and the, the client is kind of driving some of these uh, different design decisions. Well, he's asking, does the location, different places around the US or around the world, is that uh, what differences do you have in designing for those particular situations or contexts? Oh, super, um, super good question. Um, it 100% influences what we're doing. Um, the color in, of light in California is very different. What people are used to here is very different. Um, when we do projects in Chicago, the, the need to design for both extreme summer and extreme winter conditions dictates a level of sort of warmth that isn't necessarily the case in California. Uh, when we did a, a customer experience center in Tokyo, there was a sense that sort of yellow incandescent colored light um, made things look dirty. So we had to be very uh, intentional in making the light quite bright and quite blue um, and counter that with a specific set of uh, finishes for the furniture and floors that sort of warmed up the experience so that they felt welcomed as if it were a hospitality environment, but the colored light and the clothes that they were wearing all looked familiar to them and wasn't sort of warmed up in the way that we might in the West consider more uh, hospitality oriented. Fantastic, thank you. Um, good questions, thank you guys, I appreciate it. So um, room 98, this goes to the choreography thing. You, it exists in a much larger building, so it's a standalone experience in a larger building. And there, you know, there's the entrance in the upper right. You flow through into the 
a room with all the circular chairs, which is a presentation space. You can break out into the collaboration rooms, which are the round um, rooms at the top of the plan, or a deliberation breakout space um, in the room uh, to the left that has the sort of irregularly placed furniture. And it's a very tightly choreographed experience depending on the program you're running through. But one of the things that um, we use to make this experience different every time you come is make the size of the room something that you could change. So that room 98 wall that's moving back and forward is actually a super large LED screen. The slightly more ray plywood paneled wall on the far right is actually a low resolution wall display. One of the goals of the, the project was to make the uh, invisible visible and to demonstrate in real time and in an atmospheric way how your data uh, might be um, influenced by, let's say, your ad spend. And then in the deliberation space, uh, we still wanted people to be able to interact with data, so we projected it on the floor. So there's a, a carpet that is uh, textured and colored to be a good projection screen. And the uh, deliberate, uh, sorry, the collaboration rooms, you know, in our sort of exploration with the client, everyone agreed that the place that they gravitated to for conversation and collaboration at home and in the office was the kitchen. So we wanted to be a little bit more deliberate. So the table that they're standing around moves up and down, but the surface of the table is another low resolution data display so that they can interact with that. Um, there's a monitor on the wall, there's brown, a roll of brown butcher paper on the wall uh, that we're standing against in the photograph, plus the table, plus the um, digital display that's built into the top. So um, I'm gonna stop talking about individual projects for a second and go a little bit more in depth into a case story. Um, the team that I was working with at the time decided that we would approach this case story by being pragmatic visionaries. Um, and I like that phrase a lot um, because they're usually not put together, those two words. So we talked about um, a process where, you know, pushing ideas to their extremes early in the process could create a, a vast sort of menu of possibilities that could be evaluated and selected. And based on their, you know, sort of collectively, um, their collective solutions, solve the hardest problem, part of the problem first, um, as opposed to assembling the easy parts of the problem first, um, and then looking for an organizing principle to fill in the gaps. Um, I think that might be a little bit more clear as I run through this. Um, we were hired by a developer uh, named Jamestown uh, to do this project. And what they charged us with uh, was to define in repurposing this building, this set of buildings, uh, what it means to be a 21st century urban campus um, for probably a tech company, but it could be someone else. So, you know, we, this is the uh, concept brief that we presented to the client. Um, you know, San Francisco can't be reduced to a single idea. Um, it is a series of contradictions and ironies and competing cultures, priorities, and inconsistency. Um, that means there's not a singular point of view. And, you know, in this case, as I said earlier, we explored a bunch of different perspectives and began to, you know, sort those perspectives in a way that would allow us to identify, you know, a number of different combinations that they could be put together. This is a version of the thesis of this talk. You know, do you understand the problem first or design the solution first? Um, or is it something that you do um, one way and then the other way over and over? So we started by looking at the component parts of the project there was um, a parcel that could be built on. There was an unused garage in a basement uh, that we had access to. There was the plaza between all the different buildings. And then there was the roof and the airspace. Uh, we knew that uh, this property was entitled to an additional, I think five or 600,000 square feet. So we wanted to figure out how we could use that in the best way. So we went through and we started looking at each one of these areas 
independent way. And we wanted to evaluate it from a couple of different points of view. Um, the entitled square footage, which I mentioned, uh, San Francisco politics, which are not to be uh, taken lightly. The idea that we would have to include things to make it attractive to a single tenant in order for them to treat this as a campus. And uh, the idea of resiliency or sustainability, how would we position um, this series of buildings for a long and responsible life uh, far into the 21st century? So we looked at different scenarios based on that sort of brainstorm we had in the middle, and we picked the things that we thought were the, the most likely possibilities for what to do in this case with the empty lot. And then we evaluated them according to program, feasibility, cost, the phasing possibilities, uh, the different opportunities that it provides, and then the challenges both from a practical and political, or in this case, geologic point of view with the water table being so high. And then we had some precedent images that we showed the client and some of the things that you know, we might be looking at with a new building in that location. And then we moved on to the next section. In this case, the idea of a winter garden. How do we deal with the plaza uh, in a way that makes it part of the campus and actually might become usable indoor space? So we looked at a couple of different options again, you know, a large transparent sort of winter garden enclosure or you know, buildings that would span and create more of an atrium. The same kind of you know, evaluation in this case, you know, the difference in cost between the two, the kind of difficulty in phasing, um, and then the opportunities and challenges. A few more precedent images. And the same for the subterranean level. You know, do we excavate and reprogram? And you, do we reprogram it or do we excavate? Um, and do we open it up to the ground floor or not? Same evaluation, some interesting precedents. Uh, on the far right is a project that we did where uh, their main social space was one level below ground. The Oakland um, Museum of uh, California Art in the middle bottom which is a Roche Dinkaloo project, which is almost entirely landscape. Um, and then the library on the left. And then we had some air rights to a building across the street that was actually part of the campus. So we wanted to explore that as well. So do we build up? Do we tear down the building and build a new building? Um, how do we deal with, it from, deal with it from a seismic point of view? Um, and how do we um, look at it? Um, from a cost and feasibility point of view. And some examples of uh, in New York on the far right, uh, Basel on the far left, Rotterdam in the middle, and then a San Francisco example in the middle top of buildings that had been built on top of other buildings. And then we wanted to look at it from a sustainability point of view. You know, the idea that we could create a rooftop garden or that we could do we could just replace the mechanical uh, mechanical systems and make the roof more uh, responsible from an energy consumption and light reflective point of view, but not uh, go to the expense of making it a green roof. Some examples of that. And then we wanted to, because each, there, I think there are five or six uh, options and two or three options for each one. So there are you know, 10 um, or 20 different schemes that we could put together that would be a combination of all these different things. But we chose one that might be viable as a way of sort of uh, pressure testing our assumptions. So this is the combination of um, a little bit of excavating the ground floor to the basement creating a smaller winter garden and only half the atrium building, building on top of the uh, air rights, doing a light touch on the roof on existing buildings, but building a new building um, on parcel four with a landscaped and terraced roof that would help, with, help us with some of our political problems. I'll get to that in a second. So that's a view from the uh, new building.
one of the, if you look on the right where there's Coit Tower sticking up at the top of that hill, uh, that neighborhood is called Telegraph Hill. And the people who live on that hill are super politically active and they want to make sure that their view is maintained. So we had to, in designing this project, take into very serious consideration uh, what the view was for the Telegraph Hill dwellers. So this is a little bit of part of that. We started looking at some of the activities that would occur in the plaza. And some of the sort of behaviors that we wanted to occur there or uh, feelings, you know, energetic, rejuvenating, urban and casual. And then this is this space um, adjacent to the uh, excavation and the winter garden. And we'll see that from a different point of view in a second. Again, some more inspiration imagery. And there we go. The new building is in the background. Um, this terrace steps going down to the basement level to make it more part of uh, the overall campus and giving a uh, more interior volume. This entire exercise, I think, was when was the date on this? Two months, eight weeks. This is a view from the atrium building toward the, the new building on parcel four and with the bay in the background and the East Bay behind that. This is the view from the Telegraph Hill dwellers. So you can see all the mechanical pentazes and roofs. And this is one option where we do you know, the green roof. And that's what it looks like all together. So this was, a, like I said, an eight-week project, pretty quick visualization on how they could meet their goals, how they could address the Telegraph Hill dwellers, how they could maximize their entitlement for square footage, how they could redefine what it meant to be an urban campus by incorporating part of the uh, plaza into an interior space, some of the balconies on the buildings into interior space, and creating a central focus around uh, the Lawrence Halperin uh, landscape element that is um, dearly beloved by many a landscape and architecture design student, um, all at the same time uh, while meeting a developer protocol. So a little bit of the pro forma aspect of it, the number of square footage, you know, the amount of square feet we could add, the relative cost of that. And uh, we were looking to hit 400,000 square feet of new space and we were able to get 50, 355. And so um, where do we go from here? Uh, as far as this talk goes, we're gonna take a different direction. Um, and it goes to, for those of you who have been in um, conversation with me earlier today, we've talked about risk-taking and what I've decided to call hacking for the sake of this conversation, um, I'm defining as an unauthorized use or access. So how do we how do we take a risk when we're given that problem that we talked about earlier that um, isn't a straight, um, it's not obvious how you might solve it. So Intercom uh, is a startup uh, here in San Francisco and Dublin. Um, and they needed to, they were growing very quickly as, as those companies are wont to do. And they needed to take totally conventional office space and make it hip spend no money and do it literally in a couple of weeks. Uh, so the team decided that while we'd remove the ceiling tiles, we couldn't afford or have time to get a permit to build new walls, so we hung drapery. Where we wanted a new wall, we used storage shelving and mounted um, electrical to the back of it so that we could introduce these lights. We bought furniture that was quick ship, meaning that it could arrive on site in a couple of weeks and we removed the carpet uh, and polished the concrete floor, uh, which was done over a weekend. So that's the back side of that partition. You can see the yellow light glowing on the other side. The rooms were just the way the rooms were. We used industrial shelving to create credenzas in those rooms, things that we could buy at the warehouse. And again, quick ship furniture that could be delivered in a couple of weeks. And they're super happy with it. 
So, so related to uh, oh, good uh, question. The hacking question there, Lewis. So we have Megan who says we, we as students have been told to push the envelope of design, but how do we go about balancing that idea with the needs of our users and creating a space of inclusion in this very diverse time? Super good question. I think it the the key part of that is understanding who the population is you're designing for and pushing that to be more inclusive, but to understand the mindset of the people that uh, we're working for. So what we do for a law firm, as you've seen, is very different than what we do for a technology company. Um, and at the same time, in the past, technology companies have designed the workspace primarily for engineers. And we know that um, at least half the space is used by people who aren't engineers. Um, so how do you design for introverts, for extroverts, for people with different mobility levels um, within the context of an organization? Um, so all of these, I'm just, let me think back to the projects I've shown you. All of these projects felt comfortable to the people that they were designed for. Another question uh, okay. from Jordan. Um, and maybe this goes into your hacking um, uh, project, but does the increase of square footage directly correlate with increased in cost? Is that always the case? 96% of the time, yes. <laughs> because even if, it, and I'll, so this here's a good example. This is not a plant in the audience. Um, so uh, Fortunate Farm is uh, the place north of San Francisco that Nathan was mentioning. Um, that my family and I have. And the goal there was to get away from the fog in the summer, um, avoid building a suburban house, which is what the zoning wants you to do, minimize the spend uh, and speed up the process. So um, the little circle kind of in the middle is the mode uh, field around the building. Uh, the grid of trees to the left is a walnut orchard. Um, the big black chunk to the far left of this picture is where uh, the forest fire came a couple of summers ago. Um, so about within 50 feet of the road um, that our property is along, uh, so pretty dramatic. Um, but in this case, we wanted it to be, we wanted the space to be as big, as cheap, and as um, fast as we could get it. So I did a couple of small versions and they, you know, the assumption was that if we made it simpler, we could make it bigger and it would cost less or the same. And we made it simpler, we made it bigger and it cost more. So uh, to, the, uh, to the space question, even though it's super simple, but you'll see. So that's what it looks like sitting on that hill. Um, two buildings connected with um, some cables that can have a shade structure or not, depending on the time of year and a deck below it. That's what one of the buildings looks like from the interior. Collection of our furniture. And it's important to have art when you live with somebody who owns an art gallery. Um, and then the other building uh, has bedrooms in it um, and some more art, but no insulation, uh, wood burning stove. We have to chop wood um, and you know build a fire in order to get hot water in the morning for tea. So. Um, it's a different, there was a price to pay, but one we appreciate. And then there's the last example, um, and then more questions I hope, is a pop-up that we did um, in six weeks. Um, the space started off as an empty shell space in an office building. It had no HVAC distribution, code minimum exiting lighting. Um, and the six weeks we had to do this project, in preparation for a two-day executive summit uh, included Christmas and New Year's. Um, so uh, we sort of broke a convention. We decided we would source everything from the flea market at the Rose Bowl in Los Angeles. We rented a truck, hired some people, lined up a paint shop, bought some scaffolding, and uh, used some really talented designers in the studio to start creating what we um, thought of as an onstage and offstage experience. On stage, everything is blue, and that's where the presentations occurred. And then off stage, we had different support spaces like wardrobe uh, that would be 
breakout spaces for uh, people to have follow-up uh, or associated meetings. So there's wardrobe, there's a recording studio on the left and hair and makeup on the right. And then this is the view from the stage looking out towards the audience, um, which I wish I could do now, but I can't. Um, and that's it, thank you. Very good. Hey, I'll get the uh, question started. Thank you, Lewis, for that great presentation. Um, and, and being able to uh, wrangle with questions in the middle was, I think, fantastic. Um, I guess you, you show us a lot of different um, scale, I mean, from you know, global headquarters uh, to, to pop-ups, to hacks, to your own, you know, small uh, hacienda. What, what, what is your kind of favorite scale to operate in? Or do you have a favorite scale? So um, I, let's see, that's a good question. So I'm gonna to try to answer it as honestly as I can. So um, my favorite scale is one that I don't indulge myself in um, because if there's a level, once I start focusing on a level of detail, um, I start like literally becoming obsessive. Right, so I can't, and it's hard to extract myself from that. So even though I really enjoy, you know, the detailing of something and the sort of how things really come together, I try not to get involved in that because it's hard to extricate myself from it. Um, so all scales, but at this point in my career, probably larger scale makes me happier. Cool. Um, Ashlyn is asking, uh, what industry typically affords the most creative freedom? Wow, I mean, I don't know that it's industry specific, right? We're doing some pretty creative stuff for the University of California. Um, Google has been an incredible uh, supporter of ours and has allowed us to do some crazy creative stuff. Um, but I think it's particular clients who are looking for particular teams of people to help them get where they want to go and not industry specific. You know, the work that we've done for Gunderson Detmer is, you know, in in my definition, probably the only newsworthy work that I've ever done in the sense that it helped redefine an industry in terms of how offices were used, how architecture could support culture, what the sort of density of those offices could be in order to make real estate less of a burden on the law practice. So that work, even though it's conservative in many ways, um, is newsworthy because it's changing an in industry. So well, I call that creative. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna nail anybody for being anti-creative. The Barbara is coming in with a question, um, maybe really related to your thesis. Um, would you say in order to understand the problem, you must activate a design process aimed at analyzing the parameters so that they can grasp the possible design issues to be addressed? No. Um, that's our job. You know, their job is to be as, I was in a review earlier today um, and the project was being hampered by how constructible it was going to be. And you can always get there, you can always get to the constructability, but if you short circuit the sort of open-mindedness, you'll never really identify the possibilities. So when we work with clients, um, there are two things that we do. One is we try to be, we try to bring our whole selves to work. So if you're guarded with your client, you can't expect them to be forthcoming. So we try to be as authentic and as transparent humans as we can possibly be. And we push our clients really hard with a lot of difficult questions until they say something, hopefully that they might've never thought or said before, that's an insight to what they might be hoping for, whether organizationally or whether the effect a project might have on their people or how it might affect their position in the market. Um, we try to get something unique and something secret. Um, and then it's our job to come back and show them 
what we think the parameters are, what we think the possibilities are. And like that Levi's Plaza project, um, throw different ideas at them to see which ones feel right to them without making them responsible for editing in advance. Uh, Charlie's asking, um, what are some strategies that you employ when you're trying to develop uh, suggestive circulation or, or make your users dance through the space? How do you manipulate people, Lewis? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I try not to use doors. Um, so doors are sort of like the object of last resort. Um, I try to make like those multi-purpose rooms for Dropbox where the walls like slide away, um, where, where there's a physical invitation to interact with the architecture. Um, so if you look at those buildings that we did at the farm, you know, they're big metal agricultural sheds, right? But we opened up the ends and put in, you know, those polygal sliding doors and when you add those, you know, polygal sliding doors and you add roll down shades to those, the ability to control the amount of light and the amount of air is super detailed. So there's this invitation to interact with the space that allows you to, to make it feel different, um, which is a kind of dance, right? I mean, I don't know if, if you've ever had a chance to go to Japan and or, you know, some sort of exhibit that has all those different sliding walls and doors you get to make the space flow differently every time you rearrange it. Um, so things like that, Tr avoiding doors, letting, you know, space that flows, trying, um, I didn't, it doesn't show up in that picture of the living room. There's one corner of my living room where I literally have an eight inch slot so the space can leak out. So you don't feel like you're trapped in that corner. Fantastic. Well. Thank you, Lewis. I, and I, I should not fail to also thank Professor Michelle Wimpy, who without her, uh, she's a linchpin in getting Lewis uh, to present to us and uh, share his masterful work and his thoughts. Um, thank you again, Lewis, for, um, for sharing to the AP Design family. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I do look forward to the in-person visit. Yes, absolutely. All right, take care, everyone. Take care.